many other activities to bring science to the mainstream and also bring science to the common people is one of the very important activities HN had in his mind. I remember during our college days, he had also started activities where bringing in radical thinking. We had, I remember attending Abraham Coors lecture as part of uh, HN's activities of uh, bringing in scientific temper and scientific thinking among students and the people in general. So thank you Ramra for uh, giving me this opportunity and I feel extremely happy to be here. The program has in general space for national development and space application, self-reliance in satellite technology, self-reliance in space transportation, working on low-cost access to space, and space science and interplanetary exploration, on international cooperation, then also certain technology developments which have been going on. In all this, the space program itself, we owe a deep debt to this one person, a worthy son of soil of Gujarat, Sri Vikram Sarabhai, who, when the first satellite was put in space by Russia, visualized how a new technology can be used for a country like India for bringing in development, for bring how a new technology can be made use of for fostering development in the country. So we still remember his saying where he repeats, there are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. He said, if we are to play a meaningful role nationally and in the community of nations, we must be second to none in the application of advanced technologies to the real problems of man and society. True to this, ISRO has been striving all along to bring in the space technology for the benefit of India and like uh, Ramara mentioned, today definitely the world recognizes ISRO because as an agency which has brought in space technology for the benefit of the Indian development. Some of the, give you some brief on how things happened. It got initiated in the 60s. 57 was the first uh, Sputnik put in space. Then in 1960s with Incospar, the activity started. And the program itself has many facets. The it's prime is the space application. And for doing this application, Earth observation activities, then communi satellite communication, navigation, space exploration, and to ensure that you are able to do all this, developing launch vehicles and the satellite and also the advanced space systems. To enable this in the country, three main systems were established, an inside coordination committee and a under planning commi commission, natural, national natural resource management system and then an advisory committee on space science to deal with the science activities. And the vision was harness space technology for national development. In attempting to address the issues of the country, some of the things that went behind the program. See, we have only about 2% of the world's geographical area, 4% of world's water resources, and of course 17% of world's population, and then it has very large diversity, socio-cultural diversity. We are a predominantly rain-fed agriculture, then declining per capita availability of land and water, and then over-exploitation of groundwater, and we have about 170 districts which are multi-hazard pro. Towards addressing this today, we can see that ISRO has completed about 121 missions out of which 73 satellites have been put into space which cover remote sensing, communication, navigation and planetary exploration and 46 launch vehicles covering 
satellite launch vehicle, augmented satellite launch vehicle, PSLV, GSLV, and the next generation Mark III. Apart from this, we also have a space capsule recovery experiment and the crew module, atmospheric re-entry module. And we have launched about 40 satellites for 19 countries. Now if you look at uh, some of the applications that have been done, the very first major experiment that was conducted by ISRO was what is called a satellite instructional television experiment, which when it was done in 1975, happens to be the biggest experiment of this kind in social media. And for this, what was done is, we borrowed a satellite from America, the satellite was moved over to the Indian longitude and in about 4,000 villages equivalent of today's direct to home television system was established. You can imagine in 75 if you are saying that in a village you are setting up a direct communication receiving from the satellite broadcasting the kind of difficulties that people would have faced. But then it was this experiment which demonstrated to the country and also to the political bosses of this country, the enormous power of space technology for improving the process of education and also for enabling the information dissemination to the entire country. Because during those days, probably some of you will remember, the television was available only in four cities and four metros and in nowhere else would be able to get any broadcasting. Starting with this experiment, the government got convinced that the space technology is definitely going to benefit the country in improving the standard of living and with this particular experiment, the, both the program of uh, Indian National Satellite Series and the Indian Remote Sensing Satellite Series got approved by the politicians simply because they saw in it the value of their ability to reach the entire country sitting at one place. Then the communication itself, starting with this site program, starting with this site program, then we had an opportunity of using the Arian passenger payload experiment when Arian sat launch vehicle was doing it, one of its trials, they gave an offer that if you want to put a satellite, we are ready to fly for you. Because of the risk involved, others were not ready and ISRO, because it wanted to demonstrate and work on technology, immediately took up this opportunity and built one of the first three-axis stabilized satellite. Because up to that point of time, the concept of stabilizing the satellites in orbit using only spinning was there. And the, both the INSAT series of satellites was going to be a three-axis stabilized satellite. And then subsequent to that, we had the INSAT 1 series of satellite, which were procured as per our specification from Ford Aerospace and subsequently from the INSAT 2 series onwards the whole satellite, communication satellite are being built in the country. And then we had the GSAT series and currently we have GSAT 8, 12, 10, 7 and 16. They are all providing various application activities whether it is mobile telephony or FAC, VSAT data connectivity, point to point communication. It was this uh, satellite space based communication which enabled in the 80s and 90s a large, uh, large scale availability of both broadcasting as well as telephone connectivity within the country. Today of course you have in addition to the satellite based connectivity, terrestrial connectivity based on fiber optics and other Wi-Fi and mobile communication through the terrestrial services. And while we started with Apple, which was one of the three axis stabilized satellites, then we went through the INSAT 1 series, 2 series, and today we are ready to launch in August, uh, 25th of August this year, one of our GSAT 6 satellite, which is going to carry a very large size antenna, a 6 meter diameter unfurlable antenna, which is going to provide with very small handheld terminals connectivity for people both for communication as well as uh, for broadband connectivity. This will be available of course for strategic sector initially. 
so the development of encompass telecom speech circuits to start with then broadcasting direct to home then mobile satellite services then we had the private and news gathering services radio networking and about 250 cyclone warning dissemination system across the country and about 5500 direct receive systems for enabling training and development communication for telemedicine tele education and also village resource center and apart from that a large number of meteorological data dissemination systems which provide the connectivity for both the weather forecasting and weather monitoring activities today in telecom we have more than 10000 bsnl circuits 1.7 lakh vsats and dth itself more than 4.2 crore dth subscribers radio networking and then we have work on tele education and tele medicine in the apart from this communication activity one of the major development that have happened is we have brought in our own navigation capability using indian regional navigation satellite series which is going to be a constellation of seven satellites right now we have four of them up in space and providing independent positioning capability using receivers which are built in the country in addition to that there is a scheme called the weather which makes use of specific set of uh, information transmitted from the satellite transponders which enables gps system to ensure what is called safety of life and assured integrity and this service has been recognized and is declared operational by director general of civil aviation where for the indian sector this fills the gap for the global aircraft in, in, enabled with uh, what is called an spas receiver the it enables the aircraft to make use of for this uh, service for en route planning and also for precision landing in the airports and this also has been made operational since uh, april of this year and work is in progress for ensuring that almost about 1000 odd uh, air airport strips will be provided with pseudo lights and it will become suitable for even precision landing subsequently apart from communication we have been working on earth observation satellites which provides a constellation of satellites encompassing natural resources studies agricultural crop inventory and i'll show some of the actual examples of uh, these applications in subsequent slides then one of the activities that went on in a big way in the initial years was identifying the potential groundwater zones and potential fishing zones you'll see some of the application slides subsequently here also like in the communication series we started way back in uh, 75 with aryabhata as the first uh, satellite that was launched here also isro made use of all the available opportunity that when russians offered we will carry few of the satellites free of cost we launch for you we took up that opportunity and in 79 and 81 vaskara 1 and 2 satellites which were the forerunners for the remote sensing satellites which were subsequently built they were configured with a television camera experiment and then we learned the ropes for pro providing to the country information based on our observation system and today we have about 13 operational satellites both in the lower orbiting platform as well as in the geostationary platform encompassing both the visible and also microwave microwave sensor is also important because during the monsoon period of a significant portion we have cloud cover which will not allow visible sensors to look at earth from space so we started this program with vaskara 1 and 2 which carried what is called as close scan medicon camera at that time and it was providing 1 km spatial resolution images these were the first images that we got from these uh, camera systems then very soon we built our own remote sensing observation system which was in 1995 when this particular satellite went up it was designed for ensuring for the indian agricultural system providing a data set which with five day repetitivity it was going to provide information enabling the phenology study of the crops and also high resolution images up to 5 meters 
on a single platform conceiving that all such three imaging systems work together and provide data for our specific application was actually hailed world over and India was also able to capture the international market for imaging data, remote sensing data. From 1995 to 1999, we had the distinction of providing to the globe highest spatial resolution imagery in the civilian sector. In the strategic sector, of course, there were much better resolution. But in the civilian sector, these imaging capabilities were actually the forerunners and uh, provided leadership to the Indian, Indian programs. Then we also built what is called a Cartos One, which is an analog track stereo system. This was launched in 2005, and this is one of the satellites with which we are able to generate for the entire country a digital elevation model, which provides the basis for generating both orthorectification and cartographic maps. And then today, this is extensively used for a host of applications in the country, and even on our Bhuvan website. We are able to provide orthorectified images. Today you have image data which is having an accuracy better than few meters for any point on the surface of the Indian landmass. Then we also built early in 2001 a better than one meter resolution imagery. In 2001 technology experiment satellite and then Cartosat 2, then subsequently Cartosat 2A and 2B. These were realized and they continue to provide high resolution imaging capability to us. Then another very really important application which was developed and again we were leaders in the global community is what is called a prospective fishing zone identification using the instruments called ocean color on ocean sac series. From 1999 we have been providing based on the thermal fronts and also the color images that you get from the satellite what is called a potential fishing zone identification which the data is disseminated to the fishermen in the country from 99 onwards and this one act alone saves to the country more than about 20 to 30,000 crores per year simply because the fishermen go to the place where they get an improved catch and they have to spend less fuel both diesel and petrol in doing that and this, both the success rate has been evaluated and NCAR in its publication has shown that this particular activity of uh, Department of Space which has enabled Ministry of Earth Sciences to set up a specific facility in Hyderabad called Indian National Center for Ocean Information System which is providing, you are also familiar that India has a large coastline almost 7,000 kilometers and this is one of the very important services ISRO is able to provide. Similarly looking at uh, the difficulties of getting images of Earth from space in the visible and infrared region because of the cloud cover. We also developed what is called a C-band synthetic aperture radar. This also was fully indigenously developed using the facilities within the country. We enabled the Indian industry to build the transmit receive modules and also phase the array antenna system, active array antenna system which provides better than 1 meter resolution and also up to 50 meter resolution and this can give you without through the clouds images of Earth and it has got large amount of applications. This is one of the images which shows to you how an optical image looks at the snow and how a radar image is able to see below the snow cover the glacial lakes also it can see. Another important activity which uh, ISRO has been able to successfully transfer in terms of technology to a user ministry is what is called a fossil program wherein for a number of crop types today the Mahalanobi Center for National Crop Forecasting in Delhi which has been established three years back is providing to the government of India a forecast which is three months ahead of uh, crop forecast, crop harvesting three months, two months and one month in advance. What is the likely yield of rice, wheat, red seed, mustard, sugar, sugar cane, cotton and jute. So these technologies have been developed and transferred to the user ministries by Department of Space. 
And then another thing is in terms of in Karnataka itself, it demonstrated the efficacy of uh, space-based information system in a project called Sujala, which also won international both the uh, World Bank and other uh, acclaim because it involved the users and to the users the information was taken and then through their help the small watershed development and then how preserving the water, rainwater and conserving it, how it recharges the nearby wells and through that how the vegetation improves. All that was demonstrated using experiments like this. Similarly, the satellite data is used for monitoring the irrigation benefit program. Today the government of India and also the, many of the state governments make use of the satellite data for verifying whether the programs what they have taken up is actually giving yield or is producing the desired results or not. And also when some large canals etc are constructed, at some places you can clearly see that most of the work is done but at some places the work is not completed, it can easily be picked up both with the high resolution images and other images which are generated from the satellites. Then groundwater potential mapping, this was one of the very important activities in the 80s and the 90s where the bore wells which were being dug earlier, drilled, were providing less than 50% success rate. The success rate of uh, bore well drilling went up to 90 to 95% with the kind of satellite based data and also the in-situ data that was used for providing information to the community. Then also reconciliation and general centralized GIS database for net file forest and then forest encroachment and monitoring also the data is extremely useful. And then urban sprawl development in Bangalore itself from 1965 to 2014 if you see how progressively the number of lakes are reducing is all captured by these images and they are available. <coughs> then another interesting activity that has been taken up recently as part of Department of Culture is with respect to the heritage sites generating a database where at each heritage site you have to demarcate protected zone and then no development zone demarcations have to be done. Using the satellite data these activities have been taken up and in Karnataka almost about 258 heritage sites, this work is done and then we also have a program where we want to involve school and college students for facilitating some in-situ observations at these locations and then providing the database to the regional center, archaeological centers and who will use this information for their planning. Apart from the lower orbiting satellite uh, technology, we also did right from INSAT 1 year onwards the imaging from geostationary platform, which was one of the very essential requirements to ensure the impact of cyclone is not felt in terms of at least loss of human life. Many of you will be aware in the 10 years back or 15 years back, if you had a big cyclone, we used to have almost 20,000, 10,000 deaths because of that. But today, thanks to the data that is available from these geostationary platform imaging sensors, we get images every half an hour and based on these data we are able to actually forecast the landfall within half an hour and 20 kilometer error zone and as a result of that the disaster rehabilitation ministry is able to take corrective actions and evacuate people and ensure that last few cyclones we had hardly any deaths reported. We had built a VHR and then uh, currently inside 3D, the third generation imaging system which provides in six channel imaging capability gives you every half an hour image and also it provides you both uh, the humidity and temperature in terms of vertical temperature profiles and we also have a number of microwave sensors carried on Oceanside, Megatropics and also on Saran Arctica where we have worked with international partners and providing for example, in Ocean Site 2, we had what is called the Ocean Wind Vector Information Generation, which was being provided to the global weather forecasting community within 180 minutes of data acquisition. Ocean Wind Vector is an extremely important input for weather forecasting and weather modeling activities. So today we have 
again this is another success story where the based on the data received from the inside 3d through the india meteorological department we are providing almost about 28 products which are being assimilated both in the numerical weather models of ncm model bf and imd and the improvement in the near term forecast of uh, the india is greatly from these data inputs which are coming from inside satellites another thing is that like i said cyclone we get a large number of images and based on these uh, both the wind vectors as well as uh, the high resolution images here you can see one of the image why we call it as an eye of a cyclone probably one of the oh, the ocean color image which shows very clearly that a cyclone has an eye this just gives you an animation of how the cyclone track is predicted and also the landfall is predicted and this activity is also based on the work that is carried out by department of space and then this also is made available to imd for their regular activities and we also provide large amount of such information on our website called meteorology and oceanographic satellite data archival center here not only the data from our satellites but also satellites from the global community which is relevant for weather monitoring and also archive <coughs> data of large amount of previous satellite data sets are available in this and this is being progressively used by more and more researchers in understanding both the changes that are happening because the data is available practically for more than three decades now. Similarly, we have a website called Moon, which is in a way more, very different from Google because while Google gives you the images of uh, some of the latest images of that, this Moon provides you almost about 30 to 40 different thematic information layers and Today, this is being extensively used for a large number of activities like we make use of mobile applications like called crowdsourcing which is used for, for to give you an example, during the Uttarakhand disaster a set of teachers and students were trained in a, for a week's time and they went to the disaster site and about 10,000 locations they were able to report what happened as a result of that disaster within a week's time and this was used by the disaster relief commission in planning the disaster relief activity. Similarly in Andhra Pradesh there is a dwelling, about 4 million dwellings being constructed by the Andhra Pradesh housing board and out of that again using the this mobile app and the Bowen, the data on about 3, like 3 million dwellings have been collected and is made available to the department for both monitoring and planning activity. Today this uh, particular website is uh, catching up and we are able to provide large number of services to the citizens based on this. Then we also work for some specific areas like northeastern region, we have a specific application, northeastern region specific app, space application center which is set up, one of the ex directors is here, Mahesh Rao, where they have done extensive work in these areas in remote places and also difficult to work places for bringing the space technology for ensuring that the decision makers have the necessary inputs for carrying out their planning activities. Whether it is disaster risk reduction or early flood warning or enabling tele-education and telemedicine activities. For doing all this we had to build in self-reliance in satellites we started with a small 400 kg satellite and today we, we are building up to 4 ton class in GSAT-6 which I said uh, is going to be one of the very advanced uh, satellites with a very large 6 meter diameter transferable antenna and in between we have the satellites which are having various capabilities in terms of technology. We started with what is called a 3 axis stabilized platforms or spin stabilized platforms, three axis, then highly agile satellite technology was developed and then in terms of detector technology starting from vacuum tubes we are making use of solid state devices and today in the country we are also building our own uh, devices including charge coupled devices in the semiconductors laboratory Chandigarh. I am happy to inform you that uh, just last month we had the first set of complete wafer process 
with the facility 180 nanometer technology facility established in the country and we have about 28 products designed in the country by the Department of Space which has come out as full-fledged integrated circuits and this is also a very good development and we have been developing various technologies. This is one of the latest satellites which is currently getting ready for launch on August 25th. This shows about a 6 meter diameter antenna which is actually stored at the time of launch in the satellite and after it goes to space it uh, is unfurled. Today we have about uh, 13 satellites catering to land and water, high resolution, then ocean observation and also weather and climate. Then coming to the space uh, transportation system, we started our work way back in 63 with sounding rockets and initial sounding rockets were built actually based on what is called a knockdown kit. We had the privilege of working with French agencies which provided these uh, sounding rocket systems. It was brought from France and assembled in uh, here, Tulls, Tumwa. And then from that day to today when we launched our Mars mission, the entire component on this Mars mission was fully realized in the country. That means between 53 to 2013, we had developed from the satellite launch vehicle, which started with about 320 tons, about 100 kg satellites. Today, today we have about 2.2 ton capacity, and by the end of next year, we expect to reach 4 ton capacity using the DSLV Mark III. And as you can visualize, this requires a large amount of technology development and also a large amount of uh, studies which are required whether it is in basic studies in propellant, propulsion avionics or strap-on technology, the guidance system, inertial guidance system and also working on cryogenics and as you can also visualize these are areas where you will get very little information from others because of the dual nature of the technology but all this has been mastered and today we have two launch sites in Sri Arikota which are used for launching our own satellite. Not only our own, but also we are able to provide launch capability to others. And on 10th of July, we are launching five of the UK survey satellites on a commercial basis. And in again in this, we have a large amount of technology elements for navigation, inertial navigation system, digital autopilot, then liquid propulsion system, solid propulsion system, and aerostructural things and aerospace mechanisms, mission design and synthesis. And you will also be very happy to know that we realize 80% of the PSLV thing in the Indian industry participation. And we carry out the final system integration and assembly and testing at the launch pad. But otherwise, there is a kind of distribution from raw materials to fabrication of large, in using large firms. We have about 80% of the activity done in the Indian industry and large amount of uh, subsystem, whether it's a liquid engine or even N2O4 plant, which is required as a fuel for this cryo, actually the motor casing for which maraging steel was required, that's also realized in the country, and titanium, a large amount of materials also are realized in the country. This again, very, very proud to tell that cryogenic engine GSLV Mark III, which is started from scratch, while up to Mark II, we had some interaction with Russians. This Mark III cryogenic engine is a totally indigenous development and we are going through the phase of development and we have completed the, what is called, the, you can see this engine, we tested for 635 seconds full duration and it has worked extremely well and we also did recently automatic mixture ratio control operation for 200 seconds and a series of trials which gives us great confidence that our GSLV Mark III, which we are planning to launch in next December, we will be able to successfully put about 4 ton class uh, satellites into space. And we have a large number. In fact, uh, S200 solid motor is also indigenously realized. And this is one of the largest solid motors in the world, second largest. And we had just two weeks back a successful test which demonstrated the modifications we had incorporated in this particular uh, system based on the trials we have carried out in December.
then GSLB Mark III, we also had an experimental crew, atmospheric re-entry mission, which carried a module which can house two people, and this was taken up to a height of 100 kilometers, and it was released from space, and it entered the atmosphere at uh, what, Mach number 5, and then it survived the atmospheric re-entry phase, and then it was cap it's captured, and it's available at the uh, Trivandrum and the entire uh, insulating materials which have been realized in house has come out unscathed and it has demonstrated the successful realization. And we also had, like I said, on the 28th of April, we had a full uh, 600 second duration test and last week about 200 second test we have conducted. And this is the example of the static test that was done on the improvised uh, S200 motor. We are also working on, while we are doing the current generation of launch vehicles, we are also working on possible future reusable launch vehicle. We should reduce the cost of uh, launching per kg from current rates to roughly one-tenth of it in the future. So the first of the experiments, what is called X1, is being attempted sometime in September and we are getting ready and uh, a wing body system which has undergone a large amount of uh, internal test and demonstration of its uh, design efficacy. We are waiting for this trial to be done sometime in September this year. And then this will be the forerunner of a series of uh, tests which will ensure that we will master over a period of time reusable launch vehicle technology. And in building all this, we have a large number of infrastructure which is required to be developed whether it is a hypersonic wind tunnel test facility. Another thing you need to notice is large number of these test facilities are all indigenously designed and realized using the Indian industry to a great extent. And here one of the things you are seeing is also a plasma wind tunnel facility and a multi-object tracking radar. This multi-object tracking radar has the capability to see an object which is just 0.5 meter square at a distance of 1000 kilometers range. And then this is another system which has been indigenously realized in probably one tenth of the cost of what it is available from international market. And this is also realized using the Indian industry. Both the RISAT satellite and this makes use of the phased array and microwave systems. And the scanning, electronic scanning is done using the software program and a large number of transmit receive modules which run into thousands are used in this. We also build a number of uh, capabilities like a lithium-ion battery, titanium spawn, then wind profiler, which is required for us to study the wind conditions prior to launch, because sometimes depending on the wind profile at a height, we have to decide whether we can launch or we need to postpone the launch. So we have built a wind profiler at uh, Sri Arikota, which can give us up to 100 kilometers capability to study both vertical and horizontal wind profiles. We also work on a number of ground systems to provide the in-situ observations for validating the information generated from the satellite, whether it is a LIDAR, the, this is done at the NARL uh, radar key, then sounding rockets. We also have ground telescopes, which one of them I'll show you subsequently in uh, Uraipur Solar Observatory and also we have the MSP radar facility and then again compact antenna test facility and a large thermomac chamber vibration facility and this is the multi-application solar telescope which has recently been installed in you know, Urepur and this gives uh, the capability to look at sun and some of the studies of the sun this is some of the images taken from that Urepur solar observatory and we also work on a large number of indigenization of materials as you can visualize that there are certain things which it, though it will be available, they will be available at an extremely high cost. More than the cost, you can always be denied these critical components and if these critical components are denied, your program can come to a grinding halt. So to avoid such a thing, it's essential to identify a set of material which is required to be realized and titanium spawn which has been realized. I am also very happy to report to you. We have been able to successfully realize tanks which hold the propellants in this and we have been able to achieve more than 700 bar burst pressure 
while the design was for 680 bar, our test showed up to 700 bar it survives. And the previously we had to import this material, now we are able to do it in-house. And a large number of similar uh, substitutes have been developed in the country using the facilities both within ISRO and also using some of the facilities across the industry. And looking at, in addition to the space science and interplanetary exploration, we started the work using some gamma ray detectors and radiation potential analyzer on SLOS satellite. Then X-ray astronomy payload was there on the IRS P3 satellite, then solar X-ray spectrometer <coughs> and also the GSAT 2 satellite it carried. Then of course we had the Chandrayaan 1 and uh, Mars, we will see some more details of this. And lunar mission, this was the first of our uh, planetary, the first of our uh, outside, you can say the immediately the Earth's vicinity. While the lunar mission we did in 2008, it was very successful because this was this is the satellite which is credited with discovery of water on the moon. Though before that, a large number of satellites had made observation and large, even man had landed on the moon. The specific information of the processes that take place on the lunar surface and the proof of both hydroxyl and uh, water molecules being present was actually demonstrated by this mission. And this mission also was an excellent example of uh, our ability to work with international people and in this launch we provide the opportunity for six international payloads and then we had our own set of payload and we also built as a part of this system a 32 meter antenna in Bangalore in the Bailadu space and this antenna also was completely indigenously realized using the industries in Pune and Bombay and Hyderabad and a set of Bangalore companies. And this carried a moon mineralogy mapper and a mini SAR from USA and also it carried a smart infrared spectrometer, then miniature synthetic aperture radar, radiation dose monitor, high energy spectrometer, and it was covering from radio frequency right up to gamma rays it used to add the observation capability. And then of course our mass mission itself on the November 5th when this was launched, actually many countries were not believing that India is going to have a mass program which is going to take off. When on the 5th of November it was launched, in fact, they grudgingly accepted, okay, a mission could be thought of and realized in a short time. And on the 24th of September 2014, when it was actually inserted into the Mars orbit, that is when people really took notice of the capability of India's space program. The, on the day of the insertion, some many of the students, how much they were excited. On that day, as the insertion was happening, they were gathered outside their school and they were celebrating the event. And here also we had five payloads, all the five payloads built within the country for generating cameras, methane observation, mass spectrometer, and also dynamometer for photometer and a thermal infrared spectrometer. Some of the key capabilities which were demonstrated in this is as you can visualize, this is for the first time we were taking any object outside the sphere of influence of Earth. That means it was the first time experience for us. It was first time an object was going to go as far away as 400 million kilometers from Earth. And then we also had to make sure that this particular satellite, uh, the propulsion system was required to restart after a gap of 300 days then we need to make sure that satellite carries enough autonomy within the satellite because in this particular program we are, we are going to have periods as large well as two weeks where there will be absolutely no communication between the satellite and the ground. I am also extremely happy to report to you just a few days back we went, came out of such a phase where Sun, Earth and Mars were in the same line and we had almost for about 10 days no communication between the satellite and the ground station and now we are receiving regularly the data from the satellite very soon we are going to resume all the operations, payload operations and we still have a large amount of fuel available on this satellite 
and we expect it to survive for quite a few years. And this demonstrated the capability of uh, precise mass orbit determination and also the ability to conceive of uh, an autonomous system in the hardware and also the programmability on the satellite. And this has credited the top 25 inventions of 2014 Times USA. Then the Space Pioneer Award it won and also it won the International Space Award. So the fourth space agency and the first Asian country to successfully reach Mars. And of course, uh, this, they are all extremely proud of this achievement. And these are some examples of some of the images that are taken from the camera itself. And then very soon we are also going to have an AstroSat mission, which is again a unique uh, instrument, unique platform, because it is going to carry X-ray, ultraviolet, and also visible and soft X-ray <coughs> telescopes. And in a single platform from UV to X-ray, it will be able to study stars and galaxies. And we also expect to provide a significant amount of opportunities of observation to the scientific community of students and scientists in the country and internationally. And we have, the satellite is right now going through the environmental test and it is getting ready for launch in September this year. And Chandrayaan 2, of course, this will be our second mission to Mars. It will carry the soft landing capability. We are building a capability of landing using throttleable engines. Development is in progress. And the satellite will also be, in the lander will carry a rover which will go on the surface of moon and we will collect some information, specific information and enable in-situ observation. While we do all this, we also have a large number of international cooperation and collaborative work where we have provided opportunity using our launch vehicles, our satellites and our own launcher to payloads which are realized by other space agencies. One of the things all space agencies are realizing progressively is for societal benefit activities across the globe, the amount of money that is available from the governments to the agencies is progressively reducing. So the space agencies have to work together necessarily to maximize the resources available with them. And it is in this context that more and more uh, collaboration takes place between space agencies. We have worked with CANES for providing opportunities for certain microwave instruments to be flown and this has also benefited us because we are making use of these microwave sounding instrument data in our own uh, weather forecasting activity today it provides for on a timely basis for both NCMRWF and our IMD very useful input for weather forecasting activity. Then we have uh, make use of telemetry and telecommand uh, networks for a number of ground stations across the globe. We are also part of a disaster man management constellation where we provide data to the countries where some disaster event occurs and we also receive from other countries data during disaster event. Then we have a capacity building activity at the Center for Space Science Technology Education for Asia Pacific where the up to MTech courses are conducted for people from the developing countries in the region of Asia Pacific. More than about 1,500 people have been trained in remote sensing, geospatial technologies, communication technologies and also navigation techniques. And we also work with uh, various uh, international space agencies like Committee on Earth Observation Satellites or Coordination Group of uh, Meteorological Satellites, etc. We also have cooperative arrangements with a number of countries. And then working with neighbors, we are also developing a satellite for SARP region where we expect to provide to all the seven neighbors a capability using the satellite communication information for meet on meteorology, disaster monitoring and also their own telemedicine, tele-education activity can be supported. And we also provide uh, under UNSCAP activities where for Sri Lanka we are doing some work and there is also such strong activity where in situ observations systems are established and through satellite connectivity information is brought in for use for various applications. Currently we are also working with NASA on a program called NISR which is again an extremely important mission because 
this is a technology which is going to be actually put into practice for the first time and a large antenna is almost about a 12 meter diameter antenna is going to be used here and using what is called a sweep sort technique the data will be collected in the microwave region which will enable measurement of earth surface information, soil moisture and also biomass estimation and both for flood and oil slick and it's extremely important for us. This is expected to be launched sometime in 2021. <coughs> then again just to give you all this, we also work on a large number of technology development to ensure that we have a large sound base in this uh, area in terms of chemicals, in terms of propulsion system, navigation guidance and also energy storage, spacecraft thermal control, precision engineering. This gives you just some more examples of such uh, thing. We are also working on uh, docking experiments and also moon lander, ceramic matrix components and then shape memory alloys and a large amount of uh, multi-volt carbon nanotube activities and then quantum dot solar cell and also fuel cells, nanofluid and like I said in semiconductor laboratory we have a technology development. We also have a commercial arm which is Anthrich and which provides these services <coughs> like whether it's remote sensing data services, communication satellites or satellite components, launch services, ground system and other services. We also provide some consultancy and training and so far a large amount of launch vehicles have been uh, used for providing satellite launch capability. And we also have a program called RESPOND where educational institutions and are given an opportunity to work on programs of our interest. More than about 1800 projects have been sponsored by with a uh, amount over 180 crores and currently about 87 new projects have been approved and this is also a program which is continuing and we make use of uh, this program for providing support to conference seminars and also for universities and institutions. We have a set of specific cells at IITs, IISC and uh, certain universities. In the immediate future till March next year we have, this is our uh, target, we have almost about seven launches. First one is on the 10th of July. We have the disaster monitoring constellation, three satellites of UK plus two more small satellites being launched. Then GSAT-6 going on our own GSMV Mark II with a indigenous cryo engine on 25th of August. Then in September, we have the AstroSat. Then in September, we'll also have the reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator. Then GSAC 15, which is a large capacity communication satellite which will be launched by Arian in October. Then we have a set another commercial launch for the TVOS on PSLV. Following that, we will have three of our uh, satellites of IRNSS series which will be launched using again PSLV. And then following that, we will have GSAC 18 pro a procured launch. So we have a busy schedule lined up for the immediate future. That in a nutshell is the things the various activities we have been doing. And of course in a period like this, it's difficult to do full justice to all the activities you are, do, you are doing. But at the same time, I think it should give a reasonably reasonable flavor of the various activities that we are doing. And in all this, one major thing you would see the underlying is how we can build the technology capability to specifically address the various issues that are affecting our country. Currently, we are working with the current government for almost about uh, 65 to 70 departments. How the, each of the department can make use of space technology based tools in performing their duties, whether it is monitoring, planning, or in terms of uh, dissemination of information or decision making. So currently, a series of activities going on with all the central government and state government department and the current government is extremely active in this primarily because our current Prime Minister had the first hand experience of using the space technology in Gujarat and he had made extensive use of both the 
communication as well as remote sensing and geospatial technologies in planning the development in Gujarat and is the driving force for the current central government ministry and is asking them to look at how space technology can be used. As you can see, with our own effort over a period of three decades, maybe we were successful in about 15 to 20 departments effectively using the space technology. Very soon, this number is going to increase significantly. Though it puts a lot of uh, responsibility on the Department of Space, but I am sure we, every one of the people in the Department of Space will be more than happy to contribute because it is for the benefit of the country. Thank you very much.